Now, so tell me what y'all think of this footage right here. Primitive medical care of a species that had barely begun to conquer its own diseases. But as we... Primitive medical care of a species... Is that a scene for... Because they're trying to say this could be potentially real footage. And I can't remember no... I, I probably ain't gonna remember a scene from a movie back in those times. You know what I mean? But it just says old footage of an alien recovered from a crash UFO. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, man. We're going through a lot of different footage to see. So y'all let me know. This is Disturbing Destinations. Starting us off with a true crime story is the tale of Charles Frederick Albright. Charles was born in Amarillo, Texas on April 10th, 1933, and at a young age, Della and Fred Albright adopted him from an orphanage. His adoptive mother, who was a school teacher, was strict and overprotective of him. By the age of 13, Charles was already in trouble with the law for petty theft and assault. At 15, he graduated from high school and enrolled at North Texas University with a desire to become a medical doctor. However, he failed to complete the pre-med training. At the age of 16, he was jailed for a year after being caught with stolen petty cash, two handguns, and a rifle. After being released from jail, he enrolled in Arkansas State Teachers College, where he studied pre-med. However, he was later expelled for stealing. He then fabricated a degree, creating a fictitious bachelor's and master's degree for himself. He married his college girlfriend, and they had a daughter, but the marriage ended in divorce in 1974. His criminal activity continued and he was jailed again. <laughs> After his release, he became a well-respected community member and many of his neighbors would ask him to babysit their children. In 1980... Wait, 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 wait. They couldn't have known his history. It couldn't have. And this, this thing that, that gets me, man, sometimes we think we know somebody and then we invite them in our house and... We leave them alone with our family or something like that. Do you really know these people, man? If you think so, or you're one of these people that find yourself doing that, watch some of these documentaries or different shows on Netflix, man, about people and the, 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 how they document how they became serial killers and stuff like that, man. It's insane. He won. He pled guilty to molesting a friend's 14-year-old daughter and received probation. Shortly after, he met a woman named Dixie and invited her to live with him. Soon, she was paying his bills and supporting him. However, throughout their relationship, he was visiting prostitutes, and that is when his killing spree began. On December 13, 1990, he murdered Mary Lou Pratt, a well-known sex worker in Oak Cliff, Dallas. Albright badly beat her and shot her in the back of the head, and mm. grotesquely removed both her eyes with surgical precision and kept them. What the? The following year, on February 10th, 1991, he killed another sex worker, Susan Beth Peterson, who was found on the same street as Mary Pratt. She was also shot and had her eyes removed. At this point, the police realized the same person was responsible for both murders. On March 10th, Shirley Williams became the next victim. She too was shot and had her eyes removed. On March 22nd, Albright was apprehended and charged with murder. At his trial, the evidence was deemed primarily circumstantial, and he was only found guilty of the murder of Shirley Williams. He was sentenced to life without parole. Why do they put the jacket over the top of the head? Somebody explain that to me. All this stuff you done did to these people, and now you worried about some cameras catching your face or something like that? You don't want your face exposed? After everything you've done? Nah, nah, take that jacket off. Let No, no, let everybody see that face. Let them see... Your deranged looking face, fam. Like, what is wrong with you? Whilst incarcerated, officials reported he still had a fascination with the human eye and took great interest in news stories in which eyes had been cut or gouged out. Albright died at the West Texas Regional Medical Facility in Lubbock, Texas in August 2020 and is one of Texas's most disturbing but often less talked about criminals. Let's head on over to White Rock Lake in Dallas to take a look at a chilling paranormal encounter called the Lady of the Lake. This local legend has endured for years, with many proclaiming to have seen her and even offered her a lift. 
The lake's dark past includes numerous murders and body dumps, with two suicides in 1935 and 1942 potentially linked to the mysterious lady's identity. The first sightings of the Lady of White Rock Lake date back to the 1930s, predominantly reported by local high school students. Anne Clark, a local writer, published an account in 1943 of a young couple encountering the lady before she disappeared during their attempt to drive her home. Over the decades, similar stories have emerged, keeping this eerie legend alive. Though the authenticity of these tales is often debated, the Lady of White Rock Lake remains a spectral figure of Dallas's past, refusing to fade away. But the Lady of White Rock Lake is by no means the only ghost of Texas. If we take a trip to the Armstrong Browning Library in Waco, which is a research library and museum, dedicated to the Victorian poets Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, we will be faced with another paranormal entity. The library houses some of Browning's original works and various personal artifacts, such as jewelry, locks of hair, furniture, photos, and letters. Elizabeth Barrett Browning famously wrote the romantic poem, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways for her husband. And it seems her love for him has drawn her back to the library in death. Many have reported seeing her walking in the library at night, usually in a long white formal gown that was popular in her time. Most sightings occur on the top floor and some claim to have seen her figure appearing out from the upper windows or carrying a candle through the rooms. The library also features a statue of Pippa from Robert Browning's Pippa Passes, which is often mistaken for Elizabeth. On certain nights, the shadow the statue casts on the library wall behind her appears to show her arms waving high above her head. The main floor of the library has many artifacts from the Browning's lives making it the perfect place for a ghost of their former owner to feel right at home. But what about aliens and UFOs, you ask? Well, Texas has plenty, but let's look at one of our favorite cases, the Aurora Crash. The Aurora Alien Crash site is a story that dates back to the spring of 1897 and is associated with a small town in Texas called Aurora. It all started when a strange airship was seen flying over the town early in the morning of April 19th, 1897 just before it crashed on the property of Judge J.S. Proctor. The airship exploded and destroyed Proctor's windmill and flower garden. At that time, airship sightings were not uncommon, and many accounts surfaced simultaneously from distant locations, suggesting more than one craft. The incident, still unexplained, has become known as the Great Airship Mystery of 1896-97. According to a story published by the Dallas Times Herald, a small humanoid body was recovered from the wreckage. The being was said to have been disfigured by the accident, but was clearly not an inhabitant of this world. Those who arrived on the scene subsequently buried the creature in the Aurora Cemetery. A small grave marker was erected, which was said to have been carved with an image resembling the visitor's spacecraft. And now, hearing that there was a body recovered, right? That that's That's the type of things that make me think that Somewhere at some facility, we have some alien in a chamber keeping it alive some kind of way and studying it. Because we've heard several accounts of them recovering bodies or, as David Grush said, biologics. Biologics. This further lets me know that we have an alien somewhere, bro, and we're keeping it alive. We're keeping it alive. They're studying it, trying to figure it out. But we have one somewhere, man. Unfortunately, when the story resurfaced in the 1970s, vandals had stolen the marker. Although the story of the Aurora UFO incident has the potential to attract tourism, most locals in Aurora today seem disinterested in the tale and consider it a hoax. According to them, Judge Proctor never had a windmill, and it's highly likely that he and E.E. E. Hayden, who was also from Aurora, fabricated the whole thing. Some believe Hayden did it to revive his declining hometown. However, the story still fascinates UFO enthusiasts and remains a talked about topic to this day. Not quite as talked about as the goat man though. Located in the northeastern quadrant of Dallas is the beautiful suburban area of White Rock Lake. The northern part of the lake is now a state park, while the southern area has been developed into lakefront estates. Apart from its beauty and fishing, 
The lake is also known to have a creature stalking its shores, the Goatman of White Rock Lake. Several residents of the Dallas area have had their own experiences with the Goatman. According to one account, a family were picnicking on the banks of the lake. During dusk hours, when a creature of half man, half goat, appeared out of the woods, throwing trash and even debris at the visitors to drive them away. Described as a very large creature standing at about seven feet tall with the horns and hooves of a goat, its body and legs are that of a man and its face is human-like. Its skin has a jaundiced appearance that is almost greenish and it has long gnarled fingers with grotesque fingernails. There have been sightings of the goat man as far south as Norman G, Texas, which is over 140 miles from White Rock. People have reported seeing and hearing the creature in this rural area, where there are no goat ranchers to account for the sounds. Perhaps this poor abomination of nature is trying to drive away those who come to his feeding grounds of local fish and game. He may be migrating further from his White Rock Lake home as development advances on the area's natural habitat. You'd think the Goat Man is Texas's most enduring mystery, but you'd be wrong. That title is held by the Sink Winks and will be the last story we explore in Texas. In West Texas, there is a town called Wink, a peaceful place with friendly people. Unfortunately, the town is facing a severe depression as it has been hit by two major sinkholes. The first emerged in 1980 when a contractor was inspecting pipelines just north of the town and noticed a peculiar splash nearby. The hole, which was initially 20 foot wide, grew within two hours to a diameter of 100 feet and continued to increase in width for weeks. It eventually stabilized and was christened the Wink Sink. The cause of the sinkhole is still unknown. In 2002, the town was hit by another sinkhole, which was even bigger than the first one. Dubbed Wink Sink 2, it started out as large as its fully grown predecessor, but was twice as deep. It I can't lie to y'all, man. I went through a period of like maybe a few days where sinkholes was stressing me out. Stressing me out, man, watching the videos and, and different things on them, man. And then trying to go to sleep at night, wondering if a sink, because you know they could pop up anywhere, anywhere. So I'm just sitting, laying in my bed thinking, man, like, will one pop up where I, you know, just letting your mind just get the best of you, man. It, it, it was crazy. Sinkholes did that to me, man. Continue to expand, swallowing fences put up around on at least two occasions. The cause of the sinkhole is still unknown, though geologists have speculated they were triggered by hydrocarbon production activities. The sinkholes are a cause for concern, and there is a possibility of a third sinkhole appearing, but no one knows where this is going to happen. The second sinkhole, now more than 750 feet wide and 1,000 feet long, is large enough to consume several blocks of downtown Wink, taking with it City Hall, Winkler County Park, and Wink's treasured Roy Orbison Museum. If another sinkhole appears, the town could vanish completely. This is how space factories, you heard me right, I said factories, are becoming a reality. Let's check it out. We do have the world's first manufacturing satellite flying at 525 kilometers above us. This is a device to process pharmaceutical active ingredients and change their crystal structure. Basically our, our first proof of concept payload for our future pharmaceutical manufacturing and pharmaceutical R&D missions. In-space manufacturing may sound like science fiction, but it's happening already, albeit on a very small scale. It's a fledgling market that analysts and a number of startups think is ready to take off. The next industrial revolution will be in space. If you look at pharma, semiconductors, beauty and health products, and potentially food in the, in the sense of like new crops, we estimated the market to be above 10 billion at some point in 2030, depending on the speed of maturation. Space offers a unique environment for research and development because it's higher levels of radiation, microgravity, and near vacuumless state allow companies to come up with new manufacturing methods or materials that are not possible on Earth. In-space manufacturing is not entirely new. The International Space Station has hosted a number of experiments from academics, government agencies, and commercial customers for things like growing human tissue, making purer semiconductors, and developing new or better drugs. In the 2020- So that's what that was. In the last video I checked out, I was we was, we was talking about um, the new 
an improved International Space Station because the current one we have is pretty much coming to its end. So they were showing what the potential new International Space Station would look like. And I was looking at these things and they had like this, this light in it and it looked kind of like a little incubator, but now I see what they're doing with it. I was wondering, I knew they were growing something. I was hoping not humans or nothing like that, but I, now I see what they were doing with it. 24 fiscal year budget, President Biden even set aside $5 million for NASA to pursue cancer-related research on the ISS. Mm -hmm. But access to the ISS has always been competitive and interest continues to grow. When you look at what has historically happened on the International Space Station, you see that there's a huge queue and backlog of people wanting to use the space station to run experiments to see how you can manufacture and so on. And one interesting leading indicator we've looked into is the number of patents which refer to microgravity, which has increased tenfold per year between 2010 and 2020. On top of that, the ISS is due to retire in a few years. So a number of space startups see an opportunity to fill this gap for in-space manufacturing demand using compact space factories. CNBC spoke with two such companies, California-based Varda Space Industries and UK-based Space Forge, to see how the startups hope to make manufacturing in space a profitable business. Nestled in El Segundo, California, Varda Space Industries has grown quickly since its inception in 2020 with over 70 people now working at the company's 61,000 square foot headquarters. Varda's mission? To help pharmaceutical companies improve their drugs or come up with new drug therapies by taking advantage of the unique properties of space and then return those materials back to Earth. If you look on it on a per unit mass basis, pharmaceuticals are just the highest revenue producing biscuit product on the entire planet. To do this, Varda will use a spacecraft made of three main components, a heat shield protected re-entry capsule, a payload module that holds the customer's materials inside the capsule, and a satellite bus which provides the capsule with power, communication capabilities, and propulsion. The entire apparatus is launched on a rocket. Once in space, the system is able to autonomously manipulate the materials on board before returning to Earth with the finished product. When you think about automation, this isn't like six degrees of freedom, like robot arms moving around, super complex. Think of it as like mixing certain fluids, heating, cooling them, crystallizing them. This stuff is like very, very, you know, sort of simple in terms of like, you know, the mechanisms that are on board. While Varda makes the capsule and payload module in-house, some of the company's platform comes from off-the-shelf hardware. Rocket Lab's Photon spacecraft serves as Varda's satellite bus. And under a partnership signed last year, Varda is using NASA-developed tech for its heat shield. Varda also plans to launch its first four missions on SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets. Every piece of the puzzle of Varda has been done before. We're only novel in the aggregate. Key to Varda's business proposition is a phenomenon known as protein crystallization. This occurs when supersaturated protein solutions are essentially evaporated to form a solid so that scientists can study a protein structure. Understanding the crystal structure of a protein can help scientists get a better idea of disease mechanisms, identify drug targets, and optimize drug design. Think drugs that have less side effects, are more effective, or can withstand a greater array of conditions, such as not needing to be refrigerated. We take drugs that already exist and just improve the formulation because we're able to manipulate that chemical in a different way, fundamentally, than you can on Earth. Years of research have shown that protein crystals grown in space are much higher quality than those grown on Earth. Drug makers that have experimented with protein crystallization in space include Bristol-Myers Squibb and Merck and & Company. In the case of Merck, the company has been experimenting with pembrolizumab, the active ingredient in Merck's best-selling oncology drug, Keytruda. This allowed us to come up with an improved pembrolizumab uh, formulation that we're in long-term testing for stability right now. A lot of drugs like Keytruda are difficult to deliver and they start off being delivered as IV infusions, so a patient and their caregiver go to this, usually a hospital, and they spend time there for five hours or so going through this infusion process. So what we're looking at to see if we can translate that into a subcutaneous injection that be, could be given in a doctor's office. Merck's new Keytruda formulation is not on the market yet, but if successful, it could not only make drug delivery to the patient much easier, but may also prove valuable in retaining Merck's patent for the drug. In Q2 2023, 
Merck reported worldwide sales of $15 billion, with over $6 Sheesh. billion coming from sales of Keytruda. Oncology drug has a overall value creation over time, over a billion dollars. Therefore, the value of doing some research which either accelerates the timeline of the development of that, such a drug or improves its performance by a few percentages point, that has a huge financial return. Asparohov says that Varda would not be manufacturing a huge amount of material in space, only what is known as the primary active pharmaceutical ingredient. The rest of the manufacturing process will be done in traditional facilities on Earth. You're not going to see us like making penicillin or ibuprofen or these types of like very generic mass consumption you know, targets, given that the amount of crystalline you need to create is far beyond our current capabilities. But there is a wide set of drugs that do billions and billions of dollars a year of revenue that are actively fit within the you know, manufacturing size that we can do even in our current manufacturing facility. If you look at the entire United States consumption in 2021 and 2022 of the Pfizer COVID vaccine, even though there were hundreds of millions of doses, the actual total amount of consumer primary pharmaceutical ingredient of the actual crystalline mRNA, it effectively was less than two milk gallon jugs. Though Varda has not announced any customers publicly, Asparohov says they've been in discussions with a number of biopharma companies. Varda has a few notable investors, including Founders Fund, where Asparohov serves as a partner, and Colsa Ventures. We raised a $54 million Series A in the middle of 2021. Since then, we've also closed a couple of contracts with the Department of Defense. It's a $60 million Strat 5 program. So we have enough runway for four flights, roughly around three years. Varda's business plan is to not only charge customers for the service of in-space manufacturing, but also share in the profits of any drugs developed off-world in the form of royalties. Meanwhile, under the $60 million Department of Defense contract, the Air Force will use Varda's space capsule, which will re-enter the Earth at speeds of over 19,000 miles per hour as a hypersonic testbed. Engines full power. And liftoff. In June, Varda launched its first test mission upon a SpaceX rocket. The goal is to test out its manufacturing mechanism using a sample of ritonavir, the main ingredient in antiviral Paxlovid, which has been used to fight COVID-19. Varda says the mission has been running smoothly so far and hopes to retrieve the capsule within the next few weeks. Three additional missions are also planned. The fundamental metric of success for us at Varda is cadence. We plan on launching every six months for the first four. We kind of set that up as the initial framework when we raise the money and plan the business. If we can't have a successful mission in the first four attempts, then quite frankly, we don't deserve to have a space company anymore. Across the Atlantic in Cardiff, Wales, Spaceforge is working on designing its own in-space factory to manufacture next-generation semiconductors. We chose to focus on semiconductors really because that's where our expertise as a company is. We're about 50% advanced materials and about 50% spacecraft engineering. Western co-founded Spaceforge in 2018. The company now has about 50 employees and has raised over $15 million, with the European Space Agency serving as its largest customer. Spaceforge's goal is to make semiconductor substrates using materials other than silicon to manufacture more efficient, higher performing chips. Two which are spoken of a lot at the moment are gallium nitride and silicon carbide. Both are much more difficult to produce than your traditional silicon. In the example of something like gallium nitride, you find that in a lot of power dense, high value infrastructure, like 5G cell towers. So if you were to try and use silicon in a 5G cell tower, it would run at about 3% efficiency. What I mean by that is 97% of the energy you dump into the silicon is lost as heat. In today's gallium nitride, it runs at only about 8% efficiency. With space-made gallium nitride, we think we can actually get that to above 25%. This next generation of materials is going to allow us to create an efficiency that we've never seen before. We're talking about 10 to 100x improvement in semiconductor performance. Analysts estimate really? that the global market for such advanced semiconductors could reach $73 billion by 2032. Just like with pharmaceuticals, the secret sauce to achieving this type now, of- See, this, hearing this type of stuff makes me go right to the stock market because now I want to go look at chips, maybe AMD, NVIDIA, different things like that, semiconductors. Yeah, and I'll be sitting there looking to try to invest in chips because they're telling you where they're headed. We just got to know how to research and then apply that to kind of get in line with them and they're, they're sitting here telling us what they're doing but performance improvement in semiconductors lies in creating the perfect crystals in space experiments dating back to the 1970s conducted aboard the united states first space station skylab have proved the concept a combination of the microgravity and the naturally high purity vacuum 
that you find in space creates a much better manufacturing environment for this process. What that allows you to do is to create larger single crystal structures that could be achieved on Earth, which makes it easier for heat to escape and electrons to move across. Being able to dissipate heat is key. Since the hotter a semiconductor gets, the worse it performs. Our first process and the one we spent the most time working on and really perfecting as we move into space is what we call PECVD. It's a really fancy way of saying growing crystals with ever thinner layers of chemical film. What you essentially do is you heat up a hot ball of plasma, pump in your precursor gases and metal into a chamber known as a reactor, uh, and you deposit it literally atom by atom, layer by layer, uh, onto what we call a substrate, and you build the wafer up. This mini manufacturing lab will sit inside of Space Forge's proprietary spacecraft, Forge Star. Missions will last anywhere from two weeks to six months before the vehicle returns to Earth with the finished material protected by a heat shield that the company calls Birdwin. The entire system will be captured by a contraption that looks like a giant net to minimize impact. Once we've created these crystals in space, we can bring them back down to the ground and we can effectively replicate their growth on Earth. So we don't need to go to space countless times to build up pretty good scale operating with our partners and customers on the ground. The company's first vehicle, Forge Star 1A, will be able to produce enough material for about 500 chips per flight, says Western. But Space Forge hopes to scale up significantly in the future. You don't need a lot of material to build an awful lot of semiconductors. We're expecting that each mission will produce enough material to produce anywhere from 750,000 to 1.25 million semiconductors. Eventually, Space Forge oh. plans to target markets beyond semiconductors. The chemical process that we undertake to grow semiconductors is useful for a whole range of other material classes, solar cells and photovoltaic production, carbon nanotubes, graphene composites. We've even looked at some platinum-based compounds to allow you to replace lithium in battery supply chains. So we chose that because it provided us with a whole product family from day one that we could go and explore. Western says Space Forge hopes to launch its first mission by the end of the year. This after an initial launch in January on Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 rocket failed. Back in April, the company also announced plans to build a manufacturing headquarters in the U.S. Jeez, man. Jeez. Anybody hoping that we wasn't going to continue to rely on chips? You're sadly mistaken, man. Everything pretty much requires a chip now. You see what, what great links they're going to to be able to mass produce them in different ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this is next level and this is about to continue to get crazy. There's no question that in-space manufacturing is still a very nascent market, but experts think that could change. As a company, we are convinced that space is broadly gonna disrupt in a positive way all industries. Close to any company should have a space strategy. Aside from Varda and Spaceforge, a number of other companies, including Space Tango and Redwire, which acquired Made in Space, are also exploring in space manufacturing. But all these companies face a steep path forward. You're talking about a combination of showing these pharmaceutical partners, you have basically the cadence and the reliability they expect from their terrestrial partners. You also have to get over the hurdles of both FAA re-entry approval with like live pharmaceutical compounds, as well as FDA approval of getting GMP compliant so that they actually are comfortable with you being a part of the manufacturing chain and supply chain of this particular you know, sort of drug candidate. It's a hard problem. And Varda expects that its initial profit won't come from manufacturing at all. We expect to be profitable you know, in, in a few years when we are standard operation on our hypersonic test bed. Drug development takes a long time, so even when the formulation is complete, you're still a few years out from clinical trials. Even for non-pharmaceutical manufacturing, many questions around regulation remain. If I build the platform in the UK, I launch it from America, and I land it in Portugal, was it an export to the US? Did I export from the US to Portugal? Or because the value was generated in space and we're one of the very few platforms in space that comes back more valuable than when it departed, do I have to pay import duties and customs tax? Still, the success of companies like Varda and Spaceforge could have implications far beyond manufacturing. Start off with very small, fully automated uh, manufacturing satellites, but over time, as the satellites get larger, you have justification for having humans on board, and that's how you eventually build an industrial park in low Earth orbit the only way to make humanity a multi-planetary species, in my opinion, isn't just big rockets, but it's having sort of sustained economic activity in space.